Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm Melissa Ski. I'm the studio manager for the Gilcrease Museum. And today I'm talking all things Utah with uh, Jessica Kinsey, the director and curator of the Southern Utah Museum of Art. Jessica, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the museum? Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Melissa. Um, although I like to consider myself a Utah now, I'm actually an Okie. I came to Cedar City and Southern Utah University in 2017 to lead Southern Utah Museum of Art um, after I worked at Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art at OU, where I had the pleasure of working with you, Melissa, and one of our beloved colleagues, Karen Bowles. Ah, the brains of Team Zizu. <laughs> um, so Southern Utah Museum of Art, or SUMA as we often call it, opened in 2016, but actually started as a small academic gallery on campus in the 1970s called the Braithwaite Fine Arts Gallery. Um, SUMA really wouldn't exist today if it weren't for our local legend, Jimmy Jones, and I'll kind of explain that a little bit later, his role that he played in getting SUMA up and running. Um, but we are a collecting institution and we have about 1800 objects in the permanent collection. A large portion of those really highlight the region through landscape paintings, um, things like that. Really a lot of local artists, regional artists who even came to Southern Utah. Um, and this really does include Jimmy Jones, um, though his collecting base is more national now. Um, and we have more than 50 works by Jimmy um, acquired through gifts from the artist, uh, private collectors, and even a university purchased. Um, so if you've been to Utah, which Melissa, I don't think you have, uh, or you have, just not Southern Utah, <laughs> um, it's easy to see how artists would be inspired by this place and this landscape. It's, it's really unique and beautiful. Um, and hopefully for people tuning in that haven't been to Utah, they'll be inspired to plan a trip Absolutely. Um, so one of the things that we've been talking about, Jessica, is this idea of artists as explorers. We've been looking at a lot of landscape art and, you know, just looking at some of these amazing vistas, you can almost feel the adventure. So many of these landscape artists have made a career painting natural wonders in remote places. Um, one of the best known, of course, is Thomas Moran. Um, he's influenced generations of landscape painters, including Jimmy. Um, and we know him for his images of the American West. So when you think of him, at least I immediately associate him with Yellowstone and the Grand Canyon and places like this. Um, and we have uh, actually about over 200 pieces of art by him at the Gilcrease Museum. So we have a lot of examples to pull from. Um, and of course, you know, I knew that Moran had been to a lot of places, but I didn't know how extensive his travels were. Uh, one example is from his first trip to the Grand Canyon in 1873. Um, I didn't know he actually started out in Utah. So I don't know if you knew about that, Jessica, but oh, no. um, it's actually a really interesting journey that he took. and. I think what we can do is I'll talk a little bit about that expedition and we'll work our way down, um, starting in Salt Lake, all the way down to the Grand Canyon, and then uh, throw it back to you. And uh, we'll begin our virtual hike later on. So perfect. Um, this is kind of the warm up. <laughs> <laughs> so Moran traveled along as part of this expedition on what I can tell, or from what I can tell, is the Interstate 15, the route that cuts through Utah um, while going to the Grand Canyon for the first time. Um, the entire journey consisted of about 400 miles, and he took nearly every form of conveyance possible. So he went by rail, horseback, coach, and of course, hiking, which we're going to talk about today. Um, but starting out, I learned that um, he began his journey in Salt Lake City, and in there he actually met Brigham Young. And I was wondering if maybe you could explain um, who Brigham Young is, Jessica, for those who don't know. Yeah, so a really, really important figure here, here in Utah especially. But um, Brigham Young 
was an American religious leader, politician, and settler, and was the second president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and actually founded Salt Lake City and served as the first governor of the Utah Territory. Yeah, so it makes sense that he would kind of begin with him as an ambassador in Salt Lake City. Um, mm -hmm. And then the first leg of his uh, journey was he took a train down to Lehigh. Did I say that right? Yes. <laughs> Um, a town about 30 miles south of Salt Lake. Um, and years later, Moran would actually come back to this region to explore the nearby Wasatch Range uh, to the east through Cottonwood Canyon, where he made several watercolors and sketches. Um, basically, Moran would uh, create sketches of the environment that he was seeing, but then he would go back to his studio in New York and actually finish and execute his paintings. Um, he was working on uh, several different commissions when he was journeying through, so um, we'll actually get to see some of his finished works that he created here pretty shortly. Um, so yeah, he uh, keeps going south. Basically, they climb up the Spanish Fort Canyon to view Springville Canyon which is a gorge now referred to by the creek that runs through it. And the sketch he made here later appeared as an engraving in the art magazine, The Aldean. And Gilcrease actually has a copy of that that we can look at. Um, I think this also appeared in a local newspaper as well in Utah. So that circulated um, pretty well nationally. Um, next up, Moran traveled almost 40 miles to climb Mount Nebo, which is the highest mountain in the Wasatch Range. From the summit, he sent his wife, Mary Nemo, a flower, um, a heavenly blue columbine that he described as one of the most beautiful flowers that he'd ever seen. And I actually have that flower here. <laughs> I understand that the columbine is among the hardiest of native plants in Utah. Well, I actually just saw some columbines blooming up the mountain at Cedar Breaks National Monument just a couple of weeks ago. Um, usually mid-July through early August is their big wild flower festival. Um, and they're just everywhere up there. It's really beautiful. But it doesn't quite look like what I saw at Cedar Breaks. Um, <laughs> Okay, well, full confession, this is not a heavenly blue columbine. Um, turns out that it's kind of hard to get a hold of those here in Oklahoma this time of year. Um, my friend's a florist, and she hooked me up with a delphinium, which she said would fool most people, but apparently <laughs> a good eye. Um, so moving along, uh, Moran actually passed through Cedar City. Um, which is where Jessica is from. So I'm wondering um, what was going on in Cedar City in 1873? Well, we were already founded in 1851 and incorporated in 1868, which was just a few years before Moran traveled through here, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, but a fun little fact that I like to share with people is that the town is called Cedar City, um, but those early settlers actually misidentified junipers as being cedar. Um, we actually don't have cedar growing here, um, just junipers. So I, I'd like to use this platform to start a petition to rename the town Juniper Junction. <laughs> Juniper Junction. I love it. I would vote for it. We'll have alliteration. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, back to Moran. So he goes through Cedar City on his way to the Zion Valley, which we'll get to explore um, a little bit more here later on. But while he's in Southern Utah, I, I found this quote. Um, he wrote a number of letters and you know, notes and things like that. And what he said about Southern Utah is that it was where nature reveals herself in all of her tumultuous and awe-inspiring grandeur. It is unsurpassed in the class of scenery that characterizes it. And anyone who admires desert landscape need go nowhere else to see it in all its weird, fantastic attractions. Now, Jessica, do you agree or disagree with this statement? Totally agree. Um, I don't think you could really describe this area any better than Miranda. Absolutely. Um, so from here, the last leg of his journey, he actually travels down to the Grand Canyon 
and it's here that he creates some of his best known works of art. Although it was his first journey there, it wouldn't be his last. And in fact, uh, speaking of intrepid explorers, uh, he came back in 1892 and even ended up rappelling down into the canyon so that he could get kind of a different view from the first trip. So uh, I think he was a very adventurous artist and I think we're really lucky to have so many examples of his work at the Gilcrease. Yeah, that's amazing. I don't even think Jimmy Jones rappelled into any canyons, but I could be wrong. Um, but he was also certainly very adventurous um, around Southern Utah and Northern Arizona. So I'd love to tell you a little bit more about him. Um, he knew this region really, really, really well. Um, he was born in 1933 here in Cedar City and actually grew up exploring these landscapes from a really early age um, that, that are made famous by artists like Moran, which I think is really interesting. Um, his father worked for the Utah Parks Company, which was a subsidiary of the Utah Pacific Railroad. Um, it was actually headquartered here in Cedar and connected people, kind of the general public, to places like Bryce, the North Rim of the Grand Canyon, Zion, and Cedar Breaks National Monument, which I mentioned it has the Columbines. Um, Jimmy knew really early on that he wanted to be an artist. In fact, his mother uh, kept a whole scrapbook of those early crayon and pencil drawings that he did that are now in the museum's permanent collection. Um, Originally, he was mostly interested in portraits and figurative work. Um, he spent most of his summers early on in his career in places like San Blas, Mexico, um, and continued to focus on people and portraiture and even against some um, cityscape type backgrounds. Um, but it really, I mean, it was the early 70s. He wasn't really satisfied with where his his career was going, which is really interesting because I, I do really like his Mexico period work. Um, but he decided instead of going back to Mexico that he would winter at the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. Um, and that meant being snowed in at the lodge for several months, um, which is just incredible to think about. Um, so it was in 1975 that he actually launched his career as a landscape painter never turned back to portraiture um, and really returned to the surroundings of his childhood for inspiration, like the Grand Canyon and Zion and other places that we'll really look at. Um, but growing up in this small and rural community, um, he did do one painting of Cedar City, his hometown. Um, he understood the importance of having a visual arts destination or a cultural hub um, for the campus and the community. So early conversations with Jimmy um, were actually about a retrospective that would take place at the Braithwaite Fine Arts Gallery um, before SUMA existed. And those conversations quickly turned into him bequesting his home, which overlooked Zion National Park, his personal collection of artwork, and a series of new paintings that he would create specifically for a show in 2009 at that Braithwaite Gallery. Um, all of that in order for SUU to create an art museum. So the exhibition that's currently at SUMA called Find the Distance is really the long awaited retrospective that was discussed more than 11 years ago and never happened um, until now. And so it features 70 works of art um, beginning with that early crayon drawing and going up to his last show that was in 2009. Um, he does have a pretty broad collector base, as I mentioned earlier. So this exhibition gives us a really good opportunity to show work from those private collections that are in the region, in the state. Um, and the guest curator of the exhibit, uh, Jim Ayton, have to give him a shout out. He wrote a book, a biography on Jimmy, uh, following Jimmy's death in 2009 and just really wanted to make sure that the story was told. And that was published in 2015. Um, so he crafted, Jim Ayton crafted the title for the exhibition, which actually comes from a quote by Cezanne, which is the principal thing in a landscape painting is to find the distance. 
it is there that one recognizes the talent of a painter. And that's from 1906. So there's definitely a, a number of examples of Jimmy's ability to find the distance in our current exhibition. That's fantastic. Um, I think uh, since we're getting ready to go on our virtual hike, I want to point out that you're actually an intrepid explorer yourself, Jessica, right? Um, do you I don't know if intrepid is the right word, but <laughs> I definitely love, love, love hiking. Um, how often do you hike out there? Um, usually once or twice a week. Um, I try to do something kind of close to home and then something a little bit more adventurous on the weekends. And you've seen most of uh, Southern Utah now, right? Yeah, yeah, actually. Um, I feel like there's a lot of places in Southern Utah I've seen that even people from Utah have never <laughs> seen or experienced. So it has been really interesting. <laughs> Um, I remember you did tell me kind of a harrowing tale, though, about getting lost. Yes, uh, not not the best experience I've ever had, but certainly one I could learn a lot from, um, which took place in the Zion Wilderness, um, starting in Kolob Canyon, which is actually um, a place that Moran would have gone and painted. Um, Hopefully he had better luck navigating through co-op than I did. But yeah, 14 mile hike um, that was supposed to take maybe four or five hours became a 21 mile hike, which actually took about 12 hours. Um, and a good bulk of that was after dark. Um, so it was pretty terrifying. Luckily there was a full moon, but still, um, it was not a great experience, but also a really good learning opportunity of what I would do differently or how I would handle those types of situations in the future. Um, and now I, it, it didn't make me shy away from hiking at all. And in fact, I want to go do that trail again at some point now that I know exactly where the turnoff is and wouldn't hike, you know, three and a half miles out of the way and have to backtrack. So <laughs> pretty crazy. Yeah. I have never gotten lost, but that's mostly because I've never gone anywhere. But I do no. <laughs> have something on me that I think might be helpful during our virtual hike, just in case. Yes, now that you know that I can get lost, we might want to have <laughs> become the bandy. Uh, yeah, I'll keep this out just in case, okay? <laughs> Perfect. Um, so, yeah, let's kind of start this virtual hike with thinking about just a couple of general things about Utah. Um, and really one thing that attracted me to the state as a tourist in 2015 um, is this notion of the mighty five. Um, Utah has five national parks, uh, which is pretty remarkable. So we have Arches and Canyonlands, which are over by Moab. We have Bryce and Capitol Reef that are kind of uh, sort of centrally located, except still a little bit more to the south, and then Zion, which is um, really quite close to kind of the, the Utah-Arizona um, state line and would lead you kind of into the Grand Canyon if you kept going south um, from Zion. So pretty amazing. Um, but I want to share a couple of things that, you know, paintings that Jimmy did of the area um, as well as some photos that he took and my own personal photos. Um, and so thinking first about kind of the Virgin River Valley and the Zion Overlook. Um, this is one of my favorite paintings that Jimmy did um, just because it is, it does really stand out. Um, most of his, a lot of his work is the Grand Canyon and is kind of down in Zion. So you get a lot of red rock landscape. And what I love about this is all the blues and the greens. Um, but I also love that this is, this is near or a similar kind of viewpoint that you can get just 17 miles east of the museum in Cedar City. Um, it overlooks the Virgin River Valley, which is really kind of what is the start of Zion National Park. Um, up, up near this viewpoint is a lake called Navajo Lake. Um, the elevation there is about 9,000 feet. 
I should have mentioned we're at about 5,600 feet here in Cedar City. Um, and that lake actually um, lets out at a place called Cascade Falls. And so those falls become the North Fork of the Virgin River, uh, which I think is really cool because the Virgin River is what shaped and created Zion Canyon. Um, so I do have a photo that Jimmy actually took at the same overlook that many tourists go to today that I've gone to many, many times. Um, and so he snapped this black and white photo, though I don't have a date for it. And then I, I didn't actually come to Cedar City or this overlook as a tourist. I didn't know about Cedar City until I applied for the job. Um, but now that I'm here, it's been fun to explore these places throughout the year. Um, so I do have a couple of photos from the same overlook that Jimmy snapped this photo um, in two different seasons. So one being March of 2018, so you can kind of see some of the snow off in the distance. Um, and then July of 2020, just a couple of weeks ago, stopped there. Um, so much greener view um, in July than it was in March a couple of years ago. Um, and then kind of to talk a little bit more about Cascade Falls, um, it's a little bit of a drive from Navajo Lake and it's about a mile round trip and only 137 feet of elevation gain. So pretty, pretty easy. Um, and it is one of my favorite nearby hikes. Um, although it's pretty inundated with people now. Um, but I just, I do really love that idea that this is what's creating and created Zion Canyon um, and, and really um, the Narrows, which is one of, one of the most famous hikes in general um, and is often on a lot of people's bucket list. And I've done the Narrows about four times in the last five years. So I'm, I'm eager to, to do it again. <laughs> I think we even have a piece by Moran um, that's kind of the mouth of the Narrows um, from your collection. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is really cool. Um, it really is, it, it's, it's hard to explain sometimes uh, why that hike is so magical, but it really is amazing to hike through a river um, with thousand foot um, cliffs on either side of you. And um, you just, you really do feel, feel pretty, pretty small and know your place in the world. Um, so yeah, so kind of continuing within Zion National Park, now that we're kind of at the Narrows, um, I love this painting that Jimmy did of snow on the Great White Throne. And I put this in here because it's so unique to have the opportunity to see snow in Zion. Um, it's at lower elevation. I think it's around 3000 maybe. Um, it just, it, it's drier. It's, it's really unusual for it to, to get snow. And so the fact that Jimmy was able to capture this moment um, in this painting is, is pretty remarkable. And we're really fortunate to have it in the permanent collection. And this was one of the last paintings he did in 2009. Um, before before his death. Um, and then I love that we have all of these photos that Jimmy took um, in SUU special collections. And so he actually took a photo in 1944 at the canyon, the top of the Canyon Overlook Trail, which is one mile out and back, but it is 400 feet in elevation gain. So it's, it's a little steep. Um, but I, I love that he took this photo in 1944. I took a photo from the same place in 2015, um, which is kind of cool. This was my first trip to Utah, uh, Southern Utah and Zion National Park. And this was the trip that really solidified my love for this region and this landscape, even though I can't capture it artistically. <laughs> Um, it just is amazing to think about how these places have inspired people um, in so many ways. So kind of a fun little thing to think about Jimmy taking a photo of the same place in 1944. Um, and then moving into the Grand Canyon, which of course isn't in Utah, but is so close. Um, we're closer to the North Rim 
of the Grand Canyon than we are to some of those parks in Utah that I mentioned earlier, like Arches and Canyonlands. Um, so we'll start kind of with this painting that Jimmy did of Bright Angel. Um, this is visible from the North Rim Visitor Center. Um, the North Rim of the Grand Canyon is, is nice because it's less populated than the South Rim. It's a little less accessible, kind of out of the way, and it's actually closed for much of the year. I think it's only open mid to late May through early to mid October every year. Um, and I did go in September of 2019, about a month before it closed, and captured a photo of Bright Angel. Um, which you can tell is really similar <laughs> to, to the view that Jimmy was looking at. Um, but one thing I think is really cool about Jimmy's work at the Grand Canyon, I mean, it really became probably one of the, the places that inspired him the most. And I think that probably was um, something that Thomas Moran would be able to relate to. Um, but I love this idea of Point Sublime. Um, it's, a, it's a place uh, near the North Rim. And what's crazy is that the road out to Point Sublime from the visitor center is only 20 miles. Um, but it takes a little over two hours to reach Point Sublime um, because the road is a pretty rough road that requires four wheel drive and high clearance. Um, so Jimmy would go out there in his truck and, and paint and sketch and, and, and actually did a whole series of Point Sublime paintings in, that he started in the 1990s. And um, this one, which is in our collection, uh, 54 inches tall by 120 inches wide. Um, it took him about a decade to complete. Um, so pretty, pretty amazing. Um, this certainly was an area that inspired him time and time again. Um, I joked earlier that I've never been anywhere, but actually I have been to the Grand Canyon. And I think seeing that, um, I think sublime is the perfect word to describe that view. Nothing has ever made me feel like I was so small just mm -hmm. by the majesty of nature. It was a really moving and emotional experience. Did you have that same kind of feeling? Yeah, um, I... I did feel that way about the Grand Canyon um, until, honestly, I went to Zion National Park. And, and I, I think because you can go down into, the, into Zion Canyon a little bit more easier than you <laughs> can explore the Grand Canyon, um, I felt that feeling of being dwarfed by um, these just monumental rocks and, and um, it just is amazing. So I think they both, they both are very similar in that way. Um, but the Grand Canyon, I think a lot of people ex do experience it from overlooks and, and viewpoints and the visitor center. Um, and it is, it is breathtaking and amazing how, how big it is. Um, but that is one thing I love about Zion is that um, you you are in it. And, and again, talking about the narrows, being able to hike and, and just be surrounded by thousand foot uh, cliffs on either side is just really, really amazing. Um, but maybe I'm just partial because it's only Zion National Park is only about 50 miles from Cedar City. Um, and Co-op Canyon, which is part of Zion, is only 15 miles from Cedar City. So uh, we really are kind of in the heart of, of all of these amazing places. So you can see why Jimmy would be so inspired by them. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I know we've, we've talked about the Grand Canyon a lot, which, yes, it's not in Utah, um, but obviously has been a major source of inspiration for artists in Utah and beyond. But something I found interesting, which I wanted to run by you, is uh, I found something on utah.com, which I assume is kind of like the tourist you know, bureau or something like that. But they refer to the Grand Canyon as the red embedded stepchild. Utah loves like one of its own. Sure, it's technically in Arizona, but we claim Grand Canyon as a kind of kindred spirit to Utah's red rock country. Now, Jessica, do you agree or disagree with this statement? I, I would agree with the uh, second part of that. Um, 
but it is totally a kindred spirit um, to our red rock landscape that we have here in Utah. Um, the idea of it being a red embedded stepchild <laughs> is kind of funny, but um, but yeah, like I mentioned, I mean, for us in Cedar City, going to the North Rim um, is is closer than going to Arches or or Canyonlands, um, and and so it does feel like it's in our backyard. Um, but I think it is amazing for people who maybe have traveled west a little bit, like New Mexico, places like that. Um, you really don't experience the West, the true American West, until you get to Arizona and, and Utah. And so much of what is what this region is famous for, thinking about Monument Valley and, and some of these parks, are right there on the Utah-Arizona state line. Um, so, so yeah, it certainly is a kindred spirit and, and one that people like Jimmy Jones and even myself um, Love, love to visit and explore. Well, I know I've been saying for a while that I need to come up and visit you in Southern Utah and actually mm -hmm. see that part. Um, I've been to Salt Lake and then up north from there, but I haven't been to the south yet. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping that uh, this will inspire everybody who's sitting at home to think about um, coming by that region at some point, um, or perhaps remind them of some memories and experiences that they've had there already. Mm -hmm. uh, Jessica, thank you so much for joining us today and for taking us on this virtual hike. This has been so much fun. Um, before we sign off, can you let us know um, what's going on with SUMA as far as like your hours? How long is the exhibition going to be up? Yeah, of course. Um, so SUMA is open Monday through Saturday, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m., free admission all the time. And the Jimmy Jones retrospective will be on display through September 12th. So a little over a month to see it. Um, and of course, like programming and things like that have been a little thrown off because of COVID-19, um, but we are still trying to do a few things inspired by the exhibition um, over the coming month. Um, but yeah, so still, still some time to see it, um, especially if anybody tuning in is in our neck of the woods. Um, but, uh, but yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about Jimmy Jones and the museum and this amazing uh, place that I get to call home. Absolutely. Thanks to you and thanks to everybody who joined us today.